Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna podcast. This is a bonus edition brought to you by JW Betting and TV Sports Blog. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, and I'm joined by a very, very special guest today. We'll be talking VAR with former top-level referee and head of the PGMOL, Mr. Keith Hackett. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined once again by the legend and a man who I have the pleasure of calling a friend, Mr. Keith Hackett. Welcome back to the podcast. How are you? I'm fine, Harry. I hope you're well too. Not too bad, my friend. Not too bad. Getting there anyway. Um, Keith, the reason I wanted to talk to you today, of course, you know, VAR has been such a huge, huge debate. It's been such a huge talking point. Yeah. Um, me and you have spoken in the past and we, we spoke about how yeah. we wanted to see it brought in desperately. We've now seen it brought into the Premier League, but it's safe to say that it hasn't gone as smoothly as some people would have liked. What's your overall take on the way VAR has been implemented in the Premier League this season? Harry, I think it's a disaster. Uh, I think there are more negatives than positives. Look, we've shared a lot of conversation about VAR, and you know how passionate I am for the introduction of technology. And if we go back some months, you will know that I said the first thing was to satisfy the requirements of the fan and value the fan inside the stadium. And the fact that they're just putting up PowerPoint slides is insufficient for me. So I think that one of the cornerstones of why it's failing at the moment is the fact that the fans themselves inside the stadium are not being kept informed. And of course, in recent weeks, we've had the comparison between how rugby use uh, playback, TMO, how we can hear the referee talking to the TMO officer, and at the same time, in the stadium, the fans, some of, of who don't understand the game fully, are being kept informed of a process and how a decision is reached. Yep. And then the simple way of the referee, you know, I have great admiration for Nigel Lloyds and Wayne Barnes, two brilliant referees. And um, the way they call the captains over and explain the decision and how they've came, come to the decision. But you know, Harry, what really underpins it for me is the fact that they retain ownership of that decision. It's left with them. Ultimately, they're receiving advice. They have to make the decision. Um, you know, the, the way VAR is being communicated, one, we, we, we don't and can't hear what the referee is saying, what the VAR is saying. And then he's almost standing like uh, Madame Tussauds dummy in the middle of the field, waiting for a VAR review. He can hear what's going on. And then all of a sudden he's been told to do the opposite of what he's done. Yeah. And, and I think that that must have a psychological effect on the referee. Absolutely. Uh, you know, absolutely. From, a, from a, a confidence point of view, we, we referee, most sports people will tell you that when they're confident, they play well. And it's no different for referees. When we're confident, we referee well. And, um, and I think some of that confidence is eroded when, you know, we're telling the match official, you've got that wrong. What he then feels like, having changed that decision, or the VAR having changed it for him incorrectly, and he goes home and reviews the video, is where I think the greatest impact must be. And I, and I can't believe that that helps the relationship between the referees themselves. Uh, remember that, you know, less than a week ago, we had Mike Dean, referee on the on a Saturday, on a, on a Friday. Yep. Um, he's in VAR the following day. And the day after that, I'm gobsmacked when I look at, switch the TV on and he's the fourth official. So he's out three times. And in that period, if he makes one error uh, or one lack of concentration, then we're going to, he's going to be party to an error. And, and therefore, I think, first of all, there's nothing wrong with the technology, <laughs> you know. Um, it's how it's communicated 
how it's used and how we're Absolutely. testing for them. Absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, the VAR is is a tool, isn't it? It's a it's giving us or giving the referees the opportunity to have a, a more detailed look at certain incidents. Um, you know, people always make the argument that when you slow something down, maybe it looks slightly different, and I get that. But what I find yes. really, really frustrating so far is I'm a big uh, fan of Italian football. I watch a lot of Serie A, and granted, when VAR first came in over there there were teething problems, just like we're seeing in the Premier League. Yeah. But, you know, two, three seasons down the line, we've seen a massive improvement in that. And one mm. of the key differences is that the referees are using the pitch side monitors. Now, the Premier yeah. League have turned around and said they don't want to do that because of the time it takes. But we saw incidents in that uh, Everton Spurs game at the weekend that took ages, uh, took an almost an age for anybody yeah. to come to a decision. Why do you Enough, think... Really? It's crazy. I mean, but why do you think the real reason is that the Premier League don't want to use that? Is it to avoid accountability? Is it to not put the referee in that position? It, surely the time is not the real reason. It's just the narrative they're feeding us. Yeah, I, you know, it's not the time. You know, ultimately, you know, Harry, I've I've examined thousands of games when I was boss of the of the PGML. Uh, looking at errors that referees make, discussing them with the referees, how we can avoid them in the future, a team spirit was built. The reality is when a referee makes an error, it's invariably because he's in the wrong position at the wrong time and he can't see it. So the whole ethos of VAR is to, ha to be able to offer another look at an incident to, to then rectify it, hopefully. Uh, the criteria laid down is clear by the IFAB and pitch side monitors are involved in that process. It, and, you know, what I think the Premier League are forgetting and the PGMOL are forgetting is that this is a selling tool. The referee goes across, I've had another look, look I'm staying with my decision. Everybody will buy that. And the one thing is, he's then got no answer for it. But what we've got is some gnome, if you like, in a, in a room miles and miles away. Uh, we can't see him. We know who it is because they publish who the people are. But, and they're top class referees. But I just think the interaction and the relationship. Let, let me give you an example. A, a week ago, Martin Atkinson refereed. And his, his VAR was David Coo. Now, Martin required a decision to be changed. It wasn't even reviewed, in fairness. And the outcome is, it was, it was, the decision was the same. It was, it, you know, so we've got the referee making a wrong call. We've then got the VAR making a wrong call. You know, and I'm going, what's happening here? Because it's, it's painfully obvious, obvious. And then somebody whispers in my ear, you do appreciate that Martin Atkinson is mentoring David Coo. So you've got a subordinate. Crazy. Who has been advised and looked after by Martin Atkinson. It's almost like going to the school teacher as a pupil saying, um, on geography lesson, you've got the country in the wrong place, miss. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, 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 it doesn't make sense. So for me, that's where the relationship is, is a difficulty. The crowd, the spectators not being able to listen in. And then I just worry about some of the decisions. You I know, mean, and, and if it can, you know, I mean, let me, let me just sort of highlight. This, this weekend, we saw Son um, challenge for the ball. And I have no doubt that there was a little bit of heat in it because of what had gone on just seconds before. And he commits a foul challenge on an opponent. Fine. He's going to get a yellow card. Sadly, if you like, the next phase is, if you like, the second event from that is that the player twists his foot in the, in the ground and then we have an horrendous injury. No one wants that kind of injury in the game. Absolutely not. And I, I wish Gomez a speedy recovery. Atkinson's got his yellow card out. 
because he sees it as a reckless challenge. And I would support that 100%. But somebody then whispers in his ear, and he's, he's now looking at the outcome and thinks, how come I'm not back here? And probably the VAR, I'm guessing, he's saying, need to cover our back ears, boys. How can we justify a yellow card? We're going to get slated because of this injury. And they give a red. It's crazy, no. though, isn't it? Because that is the uh, okay. exact type of situation that VAR is, is brought in to handle. Correct. And, you know, I'm an Arsenal fan and, you know, Son being suspended is no skin off my nose, I'm you know, a, but yeah. it, it, it's <laughs> wrong, isn't it? It's the wrong call. And if VAR is yeah. watching that on a video and, and has, you know, Atkinson's initially made the right decision and I'm no fan yeah. of Martin Atkinson, I thought... Um, no. You know, he. there's been games this season and there was a game at the Emirates against Crystal Palace recently, if I'm not mistaken, he was in charge of oh. and, and the, yeah. the entire game was a mess. But, you know, yes. let's be fair, he's and, got and the, the right game decision. the the weekend was a mess as well. Absolutely, Harry. absolutely. Let, let's face it, it was not a good game, you know, and so it was a mess. And you suddenly think, where's the authority? Where's the control? What are the preventative measures? You know, I've, take, I, I've spoken for hours with referees about safe refereeing. When the game's going away from you, you're then finding fouls. Um, I'm, you're not cheating. You're actually saying what you would allow, you suddenly pull by. If, you t- you, if you like, you squeeze the game a bit more. You stop your own flexibility a little bit and get tighter in control mechanisms to make certain the game comes back under your control. Yeah. But, you know, on, on, again, on that particular incident, Barry, you know, the, the Premier League came out and said, yeah, we support this decision of a red card. And I'm thinking, I can't believe it. And they then quote the law, the consequences. And I'm, I'm going, well, I understand the consequences. But then and nobody wants the outcome. But then I further think about this because law is, if you like, laws of the game, is, 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 you know, we have to know as much officials. And I'm thinking, yes, it's somebody in authority making a comment. And I'm thinking, well, okay, then I'll take a situation where he's running down the field, the same player, the same challenge goes in. And instead of running into a player, which he did and twisting his ankle, he actually finds himself out of balance. He's off the pitch, flashes into a, uh, an advertising body. And he's carried off in the same way that Gomez was carried off and sent to hospital. Is that a red card? And you know, accidents happen in football. Yeah. And I, and and we have to have compassion. I mean, and you know, at the, the great thing for me was actually seeing Everton captain going across the song and putting his arm round him and, and consoling a man who was absolutely gutted by what had happened. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, f- from from my perspective, you know, I was debating this with a friend who who is a Spurs fan whilst the game was going on. And, you know, at the time we were saying, you know, he's given a red card. We hadn't really seen the incident again. because We'd seen the no. Son challenge, but they didn't show the injury on Sky Sports. So we didn't really see, you no. know, we, we knew that it was serious. We knew, you know, by the yeah. player's reaction that something had gone yeah. on there. But we were kind of saying... I, I would understand if the referee made the wrong call here because of the moment, because of everything that's going yeah. on. He's seen the result. And, and you can understand yeah. if Atkinson, you know, if he had pulled out the red card straight away, I wouldn't have had such an issue with it. Because I think in the heat no. of the moment, as a human being, you've just seen what's what's occurred. I can totally Correct. understand that. What I couldn't yeah. understand is how he's shown the yellow card, but then the VAR, who's supposed to be the cool, the calm one, who's detached from the situation, watching it from somewhere else, has then made that call and made him change it. Or if he's made him change it, I don't know. But it just seems absolutely bonkers that we're seeing somebody who has the benefit of replays, you know, making calls that are additionally correct wrong. And it's not the first time it's happened this season. No, and, and that's where, you know, I, I'm, I'm suggesting, Harry, that, that we've got a problem in England with refereeing. I mean, the standard is falling. I mean, I, I, I read a lot from overseas press and media in relation to refereeing. We were, despite what you might have thought as an Arsenal fan, you know, we had the world's best referees. 
we had a reputation. We provided the World Cup final referee. We had Plattenberg uh, coming along, we, you know, and we've got a, a good quality uh, group of referees, assistant referees. And I left it in a good place. And then I saw a lot of, if you like, the people that I had as, as coaches, as, as uh, management, fired and replaced with what I considered to be lesser capable people. The people who developed Webb and who developed Plattenberg and Durkin and Paul, these, these referees were suddenly out on a limb, away from football completely. And, and for me, that was an error. And, and therefore, we've got a very small pool of referees. We've got, Harry, if I've told you, don't shudder your listeners, <laughs> that I think we've got less than five referees who are capable of delivering a reasonably consistent performance on the, on the Premier League. And one of those would be Atkinson, despite what we've said this morning, yeah. mainly because of his experience. So I think that gives you a picture. I mean, a couple of years ago, I watched Chris Cavana come on. I thought he was going to be a good referee. And now what he seems to have done, he's got mixed up in the treacle. And all I can say is, I think there's mis mixed messages, lack of motivation, lack of leadership. And when we get to VAR, we're using referees, who I think are using it not in the way that it should be, i.e. the VAR, it's a day off, guys. I'm getting a lump of money, and I'm going to sit in front of a television screen and watch a match that I'd probably be at home watching. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when, And when... I might be a bit tired. So for me, I think that my advice to PJ Well, and many people are not like it, is, I, you know, we don't have to run around. The VAR doesn't have to be, you know, 100% fit. But let's let's pull in some former referees. Let, let's pull in the likes of Halsey, Durkin, um, you know, Paul, if he's available. Look at the referees that have, you know, left the, left the game recently and say, right, OK, guys, your VAR, week in, week out. Because under the current regime, you're doing a specialist job Probably once every three, four weeks. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And therefore, you, you're not in. And, of course, you're working with the guys who you think you know, but you don't. We don't know how well, uh, you know, Taylor gets on with Atkinson. Uh, uh, you know, Oliver gets on with Taylor. We, we don't know those sort of things. Personalities come into it. So, referees should referee. Shouldn't be fourth officials. Shouldn't be the AR. Referees, referee. Week in, week out. That's your job. You've got to take. You don't get a steam engine train driver <laughs> saying, oh, by the way, next week you, you're shoveling the coal. Right? <laughs> You've got a lesser job. Yeah, and no, and I right. think we've got, to, we've got to value each job. And what am I basing that on? A few years ago, when I was boss of the PGMR, I wanted to improve... Uh, the, the performances of the team of officials. Because we, whatever we're at, we live in a blame culture. And so I've got three officials discussing with them an error. And it's like a hot potato. It's him, it's me, it's him. And so I decided then I'm going to have teams of officials. And the next time I met this team of three, I said, right, if there's an error here, but I want to discuss it, all three of you, are accountable for this error. And by the way, if it isn't what I see it is, and you can't tell me the process or you inform me and whatever, let's see how we can avoid it in the future. And on occasions, Alice, sit, uh, sitting opposite these people, I say, right, you're not out next week. I want you to know I'm not appointing you next week because this performance here is below the standard that we expect. And, and I, it, it's just common sense. It's a £20 million pound business. That's what the PGMOL spend is. £20 million. Wow. And so today I'm sort of saying, I think Mike, Mike Riley's had long enough in the job. Yeah. I generally think he's been given every opportunity to put it right. I don't think it's totally VAR. I mean, I might be I biased, but I didn't even think Mike Riley was a good referee. But that's because... Uh... 
for obvious reasons that I won't go into now, but he wasn't one of my favourite yeah. referees, put it that way. Well, um, I mean, he, he was he was someone who I managed. I knew his weaknesses. And for me, the catalyst was at Arsenal, Harry, when he called a player to him and the player wouldn't come. And, and I had discussions after that because I'm saying, one, you never call directly a player to you. It's a player, you know, and therefore... Let's have a triangle. Let us suggest that he meets you at a point away from it. But what you did was confront the player, attempt to belittle him by your actions, and the outcome was the player stood his ground and he made you look a fool. Yeah, and, I, and I, I mean, so, he was, yeah, and, and it is, that is so important, isn't it? That the players, and I know the players are out of order sometimes, and I, you know, when I see. I think it was Serge Aurier on Sunday, you know, the referee was, I think it was Atkinson, was asking him to sort of make his way off the pitch a little bit quicker and he he wasn't doing it and he just turned around and he told him to F off, basically. So I do have sympathy for referees, but my God, I mean, if you go into it with that attitude of of looking to belittle someone, looking to be almost like a school teacher, then you're going to get people give you attitude back. And I think that's a great example, the one you've just given of a referee yeah. who, you know, maybe just doesn't understand, I'm not saying they don't understand the laws of football, but maybe they don't understand the psychology of it as well as they should, perhaps? Well, well I think there was a better saying that, that, that I once received personally from Bill Shankly, and I think he'd used it in other areas as well. And it was, you referees, you know the laws of the game, you don't know the game. And I, when, I, when I walked away from Hanfield, I took that personally. But then what you do, Harry, is react to it. And you suddenly go, what, what don't I know about the game? And that's when I started saying, right, OK, I, I'm, I'm going to start the course, to, you know, the coaching course, so I do begin to understand tactics. I'm going to look at a game differently. I'm not going to look at the referee. I want to look at the tactics employed and the dynamics. I'm going to speak to sports psychologists to tell me how I can improve my interrelationship with players. Experience is a great thing, but that's what the boss does usually in a business. He passes his experiences down and he brings together the expertise and then he measures performances and reacts to it. Uh, the, the, the real sort of shell for me, you know, I've been... I've, Nobody likes being in the public eye, sort of having a go to follow a referee. And I'm sure I've lost many refereeing friends by it. But I've gained more who's, who are saying, Keith, this is what, what you're saying is reality. And so for me, you know, when Riley came out last year, having in previous months been saying we're 92%, 95%, 95% accurate, and I'm thinking to myself, well, I bet you've included throw-ins and Absolutely. In that. <laughs> and then the next thing is it comes out the back end of last year and I don't know who created the question to get the answer when he sort of said well actually we're 82% accurate on the big calls Harry the guy who's running a business is saying that generally one in five calls are wrong yeah it's now, not I good think enough. he was it's using that I think he was He's done that. He said it. Now, the, the point is that we then get VAR, and it might have been him saying as a platform for the introduction of VAR, uh, you know, this is, it's going to improve the decision-making. That's what VAR is there for. It's there to say, right, okay, make a call. And, and the confusion is clearly, forget now the relationships of, the VAR, the referee, lack of leadership. You know, I, I heard him say, or published in the press, that the bar is going to be higher on the Premier League. What does that mean? Yeah, because exactly. Because I'm sitting with the, I'm sitting with the laws of the game that are the Bible in which we have to operate to. We know that we need common sense. We know that we need personality. We know that we've got to man-manage people. And we've no, we know we've got to be dynamically fit to cope with the demands of a Premier League game. These are not easy games. 
made difficult by players who fall over, claiming, you know, acting, if you like. But, look, Harry, I got 35 quid refereeing the, the FA Cup final. Times have changed. I sat there. 35 quid, that's crazy. Retired, <laughs> I sat there, and three years after I'd retired, I said to Sir Dave Richards, Dave Richards, then chairman of the Premier League, we need professional referees. Why? Because the game is getting quicker. I know I'm getting older, but I've retired from refereeing. And our referees, I look at them and think, you're not up with play. And when you're not in proximity to play, and you haven't got the viewing angle, no matter how good a referee you are, you're going to make an error. And the exposure of television, the growing number of cameras, three in my day, 22 million minimum now. So... Any fault lines in refereeing performances is going, to, is going to be exposed. That's for sure. But that's why we, we introduced professional refereeing. That's why when I left, we were, we were spending five million a year on referee, yet yeah, all the fees and everything else, but developing and training referees, bringing in outside expertise, sports scientists too. But we're now at 20 million. That, that same level of expenditure. And I'm, and I'm sat here thinking, as a businessman in the past, what return am I getting for that £20 million investment? Absolutely and, nothing and, at the moment. <laughs> and and how, how does the game feel? Because, you know, I look, at, I look at football because I love football, Harry. I mean, I watch Penniston Church week in, week out. The North East Counties, I'm... I'm, I'm honoured to be their president of the club. I see 22 players, opposition, absolutely going hammer and tongue to win the game. It's wonderful football to watch. I see competent referee. I'm suddenly, you know, I'm, re- I'm picking the newspaper up. I'm switching the television on. What I want to see is I want to see the skills of the player. I want to see the skills of the defenders. I want to see the tactics. I love football. I'm passionate about it. What am I seeing? Referee this, referee that. Every week, VAR, VAR, VAR. We're going to have another meeting. And you know, they're going to meet this week. And up on the big screen, there'll be facts and figures. And they'll be defending the decisions, the wrong ones that you and I know are wrong. (laughs) The people in power must know they're wrong. And they must say, why are we spending all this money and not getting the standard of referee? out of these these bunch of referees. And the simple truth is, you know, some of these referees are really competent. They are very good referees. Some are not good enough. And there must be, within the Football League and the, the league below, a sufficient number of referees who ought to be receiving adequate training and coaching that says, if we're going to drop that referee for incompetence and he's not good enough then fine we've got someone else to replace him absolutely but I don't think I don't think there's a pressure there on the PGMR referees I, well, I think that it's like being a player though isn't it Keith if, if you play in a position where there is no competition behind you then naturally you know your, your levels are going to drop and you get complacent it's the same thing isn't it if you're a Premier yeah. League referee and you know that you know you may get dropped one week here or there but you know that over the course of the season you're going to most likely referee X amount of games then there is no pressure there is no accountability and I think as football fans who have probably never seen the other side of it the refereeing side like you have for us the, the biggest problem is the accountability issue and it feels like mm. now you know before the referee was accountable you could look at the referee and say he's made a mistake here he's accountable with the VAR thing and their decision not to use the monitors and not to leave the final decision necessarily in the hands of the the referee feels like a cop out it feels like a way of yeah. protecting the referee from making a mistake and, and shifting the blame yeah. onto somebody who we don't really know who they are because yeah we find out the names of the VAR etc but yeah. you know I've yeah. seen some names in there this season that I've never heard of and you know I was at the Emirates for the Arsenal Crystal Palace game a few weeks back and yeah. there was some yeah. sort of error and we could hi- actually hear the VAR talking through the speakers in the stadium for about five minutes yeah. before they realised yeah. and turned it off and 
you know, it, I think it was an Australian guy, and, and you know that's absolutely fine, and not yeah. not because he's Australian, but yeah. What the point I'm trying to yeah. make is he's not somebody that we know. He's not somebody that we would we would or can hold accountable for a mistake. And you know, yeah. What what is the way forward here for the Premier League? Because in my opinion, they've shown incredible arrogance by deciding that looking around Europe and looking at something that has improved uh, while it's been in use and adopt, instead of adopting the methods that those leagues have, they've just been arrogant and said, no, we don't need to do this. We're going to do it our own way. What's the way forward? How do we go back to basics and utilise what is ultimately a great tool? Next week, they've got to start with a pitch side monitor. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, and the referee's got to be prepared to go across and, and view it. Uh, it, you know, it's there. I, I'm, I keep looking at eBay so thinking it might be up for sale. Some of these <laughs> uh, you know, that's how daft it is. So the first thing is they've got to use a pitch side monitor. You know, when we stood around um, and we don't know what's happening, in any walk of life, we're, we're at a station, um, a railway station waiting for our train. It, it always seems longer if we don't know, if we're not sure. Is it going to be on time? All the things that derive uh, us as a fan when we're watching the game. So they have to consider improving the method of how they communicate what is going on to the, the fan. And, and that will then, Harry, they will be part of the process and, it, and the delay will not seem as long. We should not worry about the length of the delay uh, because what we're trying to do here is get to the accurate decision. And if we're worried about time, because I am, uh, this is a lack of trust of referees operating the right amount of added time. I don't see many of them stopping the watch and all those sort of things that I know technically for a few years, I've been saying we should go to an independent timekeeper so that there is trust built that, you know, we never query, do we, in boxing, the time, ever. Exactly. Yeah, that's because right. There's a timekeeper, you know. So I, I think the same applies. So take some of the workload off the referee by way of dealing with the time. So big screen, pit side monitor, a greater honest explanation post-match of what has gone off. Yeah, rather so than just throwing the law book at people, because that's what they do at the moment. They just throw yeah, a law well, and they find a little, you know, they find a way of somehow making what they've done within that law. It's like, you know, it's like being a good solicitor, isn't it? You're just finding that little part of the contract that is relevant. And rather than actually explaining the decision in layman's terms yeah. for a football fan, they just throw this law book at us the PGMOL have referred to law 11 point whatever and, and that's what they do and yeah. it's really, really frustrating. Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, I, I threw one back at them this week, Harry, on offside because in explaining that a player was offside when he wasn't, uh, they said that, you know, the lines that he showed on the pitch uh, on the photo, in the still, if you like, projected up to the armpit and, and the armpit was explained in the newspaper as the reason why it was ahead of the, the body of the opponent ahead of the, to, to make an offside position. And somebody asked me the question, I said, well, it, it's dead clear. Uh, whoever's explained that to the fan has explained it incorrectly in law. The armpit is part of the arm. It's the underside of the arm. Yeah. And the reason I explained that is because people often in the past, Harry, have said, what's an hand ball? And I've said, well, it's, the, it's their hand and the arm up to the joint in the shirt sleeve. So in reality, when they're saying it's the armpit, that doesn't count because an hand and arm, in terms of the offside law, is discounted. Absolutely. It's the head, the other upper body. And therefore, I take your point, you're absolutely spot on. But the practical side, that everybody understands what they're talking about. Not law 11.4.5. That's for me to worry about. That's for me to determine. That's for me to say, look, I think that law is, is crazy. You know, where, you know, we've suddenly changed handball, for example, where an attacker is penalised 
And for the same scenario, a defender isn't. I mean, <laughs> you know, we've had the goalkeeper excluded in the past, but not a forward and defender. Because what the confusion is that when Delhi handled, Delhi Ali handled in the penalty area, they wanted a penalty kick, some people, because it was a forward. Yeah. <laughs> but Delhi Ali was in a defending position. And then I'm saying to myself, I wonder why, given the law, and I've got it in front of me, a penalty kick was not awarded. Why did it take three and a half minutes to actually determine that? And I just, I mean, I watched it on television and I just thought, this is an absolute joke. I switched the television off. And then, because I wanted to see the game, I switched it back on. But <laughs> I was getting frustrated with a degree of knowledge about the law. But I was also thinking of the fan in the stadium thinking... What's he thinking? Two and a half minutes. Crazy, Ridiculous. isn't it? I mean, there was a, there was another incident in that game as well. The the Son uh, penalty appeal, where they almost they said no penalty, and then they stopped the restart again to look at it again. Yeah, and it was like, you yeah, know, well, hold on, have you seen it yet? If you have made your decision and you've said no penalty, why are we pausing again to look at it again? Like it just it feels it gives you no confidence in what they're doing when they do things like that. And, yeah, you know, it, yeah. it drives Harry, me mad. Well, Harry, you're spot on with that because, you know, the, the criteria for VAR intervention is a serious and obvious error. Now, on this occasion, Atkinson was ideally positioned. He got a great view. I think he judged it spot on. He said no penalty. Why did the VAR come in? How? I mean, I, I'm, they're checking it. Checking what? It wasn't a serious and obvious error. And times many, we're beginning to see undue interference by the VAR to justify the VAR. And when we want them to make the big call, right, they're getting it wrong. And, and so what we've got, if anybody in the PGM world and the Premier League this week are starting to defend the VAR system and how it is operating and how it's used, right, then, frankly, they're out of order. And then the other side of it is, I've heard this, well, it's new to us. We've only been in operation since the start of the season. Harry, they started it in the FA Cup two years ago. They've been operating it in the FA Cup. These are the same referees, yeah. the same PAR, you know. And therefore, one's got the question, who is training them? Who is making them accountable? What actions are they taking to improve? And if I was an match referee, I've got to tell you, and I did that for 23 years on the footballing and Premier League, I'd be knocking on the door of the boss saying, I don't care about the others, I want this screen. Why? Because I want this decision, and I'm holding that decision, and I'm prepared to change it because of VAR if I get another look. Absolutely. Whereas... I think they must be going home and laughing. And I, and sadly, I don't. I, 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 there's no level of accountability, is there? I don't know what how they feel as a group, but they can't be happy. They can't be happy. They must be running around looking at each other and living in a blame and culture. You know, I've lived amongst the referees as the boss, and I know how competitive that environment is. Yeah, and I also know who our best referees are. And I know the referees that need to be moved on. I know some of the new guys that have come on need to be blooded. They need the games. I know one new guy that needs to shunt out because he's not good enough. I didn't think he was the right selection. Yes, like a fan, I go in conditioned in certain areas, but I'm open enough to say, look, having, having taken over, if you like, in refereeing, um, you know, when, when I entered refereeing, I watch people, the, the real top players. Then I ran them the line, the Jack Taylors, the Bob Mathesons, the Pat Partridges. These were guys who I run the line to. And then when I became a referee, I wanted to be better than them. And now at the moment, I'm looking up and I'm thinking, well, I know that Michael Oliver is our best referee because he's the, the one that delivers the most consistent performances. Yep. And then a, a couple of weeks ago, He's not out in the middle, he's VAR, VAR, twice on a weekend. And I'm going, would you, if you were Spurs, 
would you put Harry Kane not on? You know, <laughs> you would, whatever would you? it is. Yeah, what it's... are the top players, and would you not utilise them? And and therefore, it, it's, it's no different in referee. Absolutely. It, it's absolutely no different. They're a team of officials. I used to say they were the 21st team of the Premier League, and as such, we'd operate the same regime. Just like the manager sits down with a paper in front of them, there's solid choices of who's going to be in what position. And then if I'm going to replace any of those, then there's got to be a player that's absolutely in form. There's got to be a referee that's knocking on the door that's got to be absolutely in form. Absolutely. And it's, it, they're not there. They're no, just... You're right. We're, we're a million miles away from that. Absolutely right. Keith, thank you so, so much again for giving us your time. I really, really appreciate it. Um, some Pleasure, fantastic Harry. insight as always, some great points. And uh, I look forward to speaking to you again in the very near future. Thanks, Harry. Take care. Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to hit subscribe, hit like, hit share, leave us a review. Check out tvsportsblog.com and jwbetting.com, our sponsors for today's bonus edition. We'll be back very, very soon with more football and Arsenal-related content. Until then, take care. Ciao.